Introducing this year's most sought after rookie, the M&T Bank Jets debit card. This superstar is sure to be charging through checkout lines all season long. Hey Jets fans, you gotta get your hands on the M&T Jets debit card. Rush into any M&T Bank branch today or learn more by clicking the banner. M&T Bank, the official community bank of your New York Jets. Offers subject to change in certain restrictions, conditions, and fees may apply. Member FDIC. Welcome to Stranger Things with Jay, Jack, and Mike. My name is Jay. My name is Mike. And I'm Easy Peasy. And welcome to the show. How's it going, gentlemen? Still, I, all right, Jack, this has become a thing now. What, I, yeah, why did you do it? Something, but I don't remember. <laughs> Easy Peasy? They said it in the show. But it's like, is Radio, that, Radio, Shack Bo- Radio Shack Bob. I don't trust him. That's why I'm bringing it up. I don't trust. I'm going to say it right now. Ooh. I can't wait to watch the next two episodes because I don't trust Radio Shack Bob. Mm. He's I up to he's up to no good. I don't know. I feel like Bob is. I it would make sense if we're halfway through the season at this point. If we got some hint towards Bob maybe being up to more nefarious purposes, but I feel like he's such a helpless doof of a character that to have him do a heel turn three quarters of the way through the season just wouldn't make sense to me at this point. I just don't. I don't trust Bob. Well, Bob what, is too What nice. about Bob? Do you not trust? What about Nothing. Bob? <laughs> I, I, he's he's just he's just not. Tr- he just he's too nice. Is that your problem? He, with he's him? too nice. I, I just I, I he's up to no good. I, he, and when when Will was going through that thing where the thing was going through his body, they flashed it. You know, Bob saying easy peasy. Why would they? Why would they flash to that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, uh, much like the smoke monster took the form of Yemi, Mr. Echo's brother, at one point in time. So the, so the Thessal Hydra took the form of Bob. Radio Shack Bob. Yeah, I, just, I don't trust him. Uh, Radio it's, well, Shack it's Bob, Bob the Brain, speaking. right? Wasn't that the nickname that Hopper said in like the first episode? Or yeah, I, when he was kind of making fun of him? You know, and Hopper doesn't like him either. Do you, do you guys, did you guys get, do you guys get the little Easter egg in the third episode of what Bob's last name is? No. His name is Bob Newby. <laughs> oh, isn't that? Uh, oh, oh, because he's the new character. Nice. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's his literal last name, but I think it's also a not too subtle reference to the fact that he's a new character. So we, I think we were yeah. talking about last episode is Paul Reiser's character, like the the bad guy. You know, the guy that's acting nice, but it's really a bad guy. But Jack, you're you're calling it here in the first moments of this chapter two of our uh, Stranger Things two podcast. Uh, you're saying Bob's the bad guy, and he bling, he brings bologna sandwiches. Come on. Bologna was big in the 80s. Absolutely. I, it was It was like the key plot point in Monster Squad. Or no, I was thinking not Monster Squad. I'm thinking of a Troll 2 is where the bologna is really a key plot point. Do they still sell bologna? Oh, yeah. Because I know bologna was big. You know, that was it was a cheap, easy meal, you know, during the, in the 60s and the 70s. The FDA has yet to crack down on big bologna. It's just too big to bring <laughs> down. What is bologna? I mean. We just ate it. Just said, okay. Uh, I think you could Google that one, Jack. Uh, it's, like well, spe- it's like spam and all the other stuff. Well, now that we have Jack's proclamations aside, uh, let's thank people that make this show possible, our patrons, over at patreon.com slash Jack. All of the podcasts on the Jane Jack Network are listener-supported. And without our listener support, we would not be able to do these shows like Stranger Things with Jay, Jack, and Mike. So if you'd like to become a patron, go to jayandjack.com and click on the Become a Patron link today. All right, gentlemen, are you ready to get into the recap for these two episodes, Pollywog and Will the Wise? Mm-hmm. All right, mm-hmm. let's do it, starting with Pollywog. Um, in flashbacks, Hopper finds Eleven in the woods and sets up his grandfather's hunting cabin as a place for her to live in. In the present, Bob, Joyce's girlfriend, encourages Will to stand up to his fears. Nancy persuades Jonathan to help her on a mission to tell Barb's parents the truth. Hopper asks Dr. Owens to investigate the pumpkin rotting incidents. Dustin tries to learn more about the strange creature he found, a small slug-like animal that he names D'Artagnan, Dart for short, and shows it to the other kids at the school. Will describes his hallucinations, and they conclude that Dart is from the Upside Down. Eleven leaves the cabin to look for Mike. She sees him arguing with Max and mistakes them as flirting. Joyce discovers an image of Will's vision on the video camera Will carried while trick-or-treating. Dart escapes. Will find it, finds it 
which triggers another hallucination. Will follows Bob's advice and confronts the shadow much monster, but it forces a shadow tentacle down his throat. So top moments. It starts out with uh, what Mike proclaimed uh, is going to be the porg of this series. Uh, where, was your theory confirmed here, Mike? With dark, uh, the for dark like an canyon. episode and a half. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 once its face opened up at the end of the second episode that we're going to cover here, episode four, I feel like that theory might become a little debunked. It's evolving at an alarming pace, much more than even Gizmo did during the course of Gremlins. But I, I think it's stuck to that prediction that I made for at least most of the episode that we're going to talk about here. Yeah, I will say, because uh, in some of the press, like pre-show press, they did talk about how uh, Dustin would kind of have a character that be kind of came his pet. Um, so I, I felt like it was a good call by you, Mike. But to your point, it didn't last, or at least who knows how it's going to go, but I don't see how he keeps uh, what seems to be a baby Demogorgon, uh, his pets, uh, since it, it killed poor uh, Mew Mew. But he loves it. Can he love it now? We last saw it killing his his mom's beloved cat. Well, I do like, did he, it, it, we're it, jumping the gun into the second episode. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I but, but I do like I do like in general this Dustin storyline because again I do feel like maybe one of the very few drawbacks of that first season overall is that Lucas and Dustin in particular are two characters that kind of get the short shrift. Will obviously is the focus of a lot of things, and Mike is pretty much the main character. Uh, along with Eleven and a couple of other characters of that first season. So I'm happy that they're giving them a little bit more to do. It seems like, you know, Dustin's doing his thing with Dart. It seems like Lucas might have his own little storyline with Billy and Max that we'll get to in the fourth episode here. But I think of the two guys, if you're going to give this storyline to one of them, I think Dustin's the clear choice here because he definitely seems to be the more kind-hearted of them. And, you know, as a little miffed I was about him deciding to hide Dart at the end of this first episode because I knew it was going to balloon into something else and he's going to regret this decision. I think it made sense from a character perspective. Yeah, I agree. But here, here, the problem I had is in season one, Dustin was the voice of reason, right? He was the one that the calming voice, the, 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 le the level headed one. And now he's keeping this thing that he shouldn't be keeping because he formed an attachment to it. He named it. That's rule number one. Of if you find some strange creature uh, that you uh, you know want to try and convince, or you know you're not going to convince your parents to let you keep, don't name the the creature because you're just going to get attached. Well, to does it. does he have a dad? Do we we haven't seen a dad, so uh, we haven't. We have not. No, I'm assuming not. And I feel like I don't want to go much into the inner psychology of Dustin's mother, but I feel like. Uh, she seems so like attached to him and subsequently to her now deceased cat that something tells me maybe like he left her or some sort of broken home situation happened that allowed her to kind of overcompensate and really become not necessarily a helicopter parent to Dustin, but definitely very comforting. Yep. Okay. Agreed. Um, this episode extends the Eleven and Hopper story. So we get more of the flashback, uh, how uh, she ended up in his cabin, um, them setting up the cabin, which is like really adorable with him, you know, putting on the record Jim Croce uh, and, and then kind of cleaning it up and making a, this house a home or this this, this shanty cabin a home. Um, and uh, but also a, a bit of a teenager 11 here uh, mm. uh, fighting uh, with Hopper. Yeah. So a few things about these flashback scenes, uh, as you mentioned before. Uh, the, the You Don't Mess Around with Jim album, which of course is very appropriate considering that we have a character named Jim Hopper and it seems like uh, Hawkins is trying to mess around with him. And I think they're finding out very soon that that's not a good thing to do necessarily. But I mean, a couple of other uh, Jim Croce's uh, big songs are, you know, Bad by Leroy Brown, but the one I like to focus on is Time in a Bottle, which considering what we sort of found out in the second episode in this bunch about Will's perhaps new powers that he was inflicted with with the Thessal Hydra, maybe that's uh, maybe that's another song that we'll hear played during the, again, a much ballooned budget in terms of soundtrack <laughs> rights that happen, has happened in Stranger Things Season 2 so far. Agreed. Uh, Jack, were, were you a fan of uh, uh, Hopper's musical taste here? You saw his records. I, I saw Dark Side of the Moon, uh, among others, in his little record collection. I think he's quite the dancer. <laughs> he has more moves than you, I must say. I know, which is scary, because if I, I, was, I was Hopper for Halloween, I don't think I could have pulled it off. No, 
I, I don't no. think so. <laughs> Good thing it was before anyone saw episode three, or they would have said, you know, dance. If you're, you're Jim like, Hopper, why aren't you dancing? I can't dance. I can't dance. <laughs> Uh, even though, even though I, I do a podcast on dancing, but I, I just I'm just a judge. Well, though, yeah, those who cannot do teach, right? Or and those who cannot teach exactly just talking to a microphone for a little <laughs> while about it every week. Uh, another thing I want to point about this flashback scene is I forget is it a flashback when he's reading to her in bed yes, this episode? I think so. so yeah. He's reading an excerpt from Anne of Green Gables, uh, basically talking about. This is a, and every Gibble, for those of you that don't know, is a story about a girl who essentially got orphaned and sort of has to go live on this farm with these group of people that begrudgingly don't like her at first, but then sort of grow to love her. Uh, very akin to the situation we saw Eleven go through, to the point of where there is a line from Anne of Green Gables, I looked this up, shortly before, you know, the, the line that Hopper was, the passage that Hopper was reading to her, that says, I was 11 last March. So uh, they're so on the nose nice. that snot is pouring out of Stranger Things in terms of all the references <laughs> that they're trying to make here. Good call out. Good, a good call out and, and uh, uh, feature there for some uh, book knowledge that I know Jack's just not going to be able to contribute to this show. So thank you, Mike, for that. Um, I'm in and out. You know me. Uh, <laughs> uh Number three, Steve and Nancy on the rocks, Trouble in Paradise. Uh, they they kind of have a, or um, Steve kind of you know, says, hey, it seems you want to hang out with Jonathan because you don't really love me. Um, Steve going back to his old ways, or is he, is he justified here in his upsetness? Mm. I, uh. think he, I think he's justified, but he's a little whiny, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think this is what we sort of talked about in the second episode as well, and that, like, I think he has a right to be mad, but at the same time, He's kind of going about it in kind of a, a whiny way. Uh, though, to be fair, Nancy also caught him at a bad time because we're, for him being the big basketball superstar that he apparently was beforehand, he's getting properly schooled by Billy here, the new kid on the team. The question I had is when Steve sort of got taken out to talk to Nancy, was this gym class? Was this practice? Because they're wearing phys ed shirts, but they're also playing like shirts versus skins and i don't even know if i don't know if in the 80s they played that type of thing in gym class uh you did what shirts versus skins yeah yeah we still had that in high school at least when i went yeah to what? yeah oh man i guess oh, the, the, well we we grew up in san diego you could do that <laughs> yeah on this all all us east coast elites over here uh <laughs> couldn't couldn't do it in the early 2000s too prim and proper well, well, it's too too cold i mean you know, it's, it's cold outside. That's true. Actually, our gym was located like, you know, and had the door to outside. So it was never really well heated. So, yeah, that probably does make sense. Save some kids uh, the chances of getting frostbite in the dead of winter. Um, and my, my high school was so well funded, a.k.a. it wasn't well funded, that we still had real to real projectors as our educational videos. Ooh. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I think the same showers that they had here in Hawkins. Um, again, I went to school late 90s, uh, early 2000s. So. Um, I, I I had a very similar high school experience as these kids in the eighties, uh, but that's just because how well uh, public schools are funded. Hey, your your, your school your school had a pool. We did. We did have pool PE for like oh man, it was like two months. Was like swimming, which was awesome. Uh, we uh, we had a pool, we but we barely used it because there was too much PEE in it all the time. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> we had a pool and a pond, but no, we didn't. Have, we actually had neither. Um, well, we did. We did have drivers that that had car. We had a driving range with real cars. Oh, wow! Wait, so driving range it, golf or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it was called a driving range for cars. It oh, was okay. a it had like a little course just, that like, like stop drive it over a cliff to see how far it would go. <laughs> no, it was uh, it had it was like actual streets and it was a set. It's a whole setup on the uh, by the football field. And used they were Datsuns or Nissans now. Um, and then they. Then they didn't have any money. But can I can I say one thing about? Uh, did we talk about Dustin going to the library? Uh, no. Is this library? Is it Seven Eleven? Is it open twenty four hours? He went. Uh, he went it was like he, daytime. Well, he went before school started, right? I guess. Okay. What time does the library open up? Is this poor woman? Well, he working? was late to school, so we don't know really. If, okay, if school right. starts at eight or something, I don't know. Also, <laughs> I I love these kids to death, but like. Dustin is kind of bringing it on to himself as a target when, you know, he comes into, like, Mr. Clark's class late, and then Clark tries to get his attention, and he responds with, yes, my lord. Like, <laughs> such a, I'm getting a weird, like, Ramsey Reek vibe from Dustin and Mr. Clark. 
I, I was thinking maybe more of a, a Captain, oh, Captain, my Captain, uh, a Dead Poet <laughs> Society, maybe. Because uh, Mr. Clark's a pretty, pretty awesome teacher. I, I, I was, I, I'm not, I was never a big fan of school, but I was in, entranced in some of his lectures. Uh, he was giving this episode about the, uh, the pole through the head guy. Yeah, um, Phineas like, Gage. It's so, <laughs> it's so interesting about Phineas Gage, too, because uh, actually my wife and I both listened to a podcast about, like, medical history that talks about some of these things. And I believe the case of Phineas Gage, who sort of got this pole through his head, was actually one of the initial reasons why medical professionals were exploring the idea of lobotomies, because they saw, as Clark said, like a personality change. And they're like, OK, maybe if we remove parts of the brain or change around parts of the brain, that could fundamentally change people's personalities. Uh, so it's it's such a weird thing to see how this one incident was sort of a domino effect for everything that was to come. And that worked out really well. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> just just ask the lost Kennedy sister. Didn't she? Wasn't she lobotomized? I think so. Ouch. Anyways, doesn't matter. Too, too soon. Staying on track. Uh, number four. Uh, Hopper tells Doctor Paul Reiser, aka Sam, to convince him the dead pumpkin crops aren't from Hawkins. Um, so Hopper's angry. Don't make Hopper angry. But Reiser doesn't. Fl- um, he doesn't flinch. He, but he kind of did because he tried to push back, saying, "You're not in charge of me." Um, and uh, Hopper's like, "We'll prove it." You know, like convince me. Yeah, at this point, I uh, again not knowing what was going to happen in the next episode when Hopper actually explores you know, the the crop and actually find something underneath. I was wondering if we were going to go into some form of like some Cold War or some sort of like mutually assured destruction between the two where essentially both parties sort of realize that the other one is powerful enough to take them down. So they decide not to do anything about it. But again, Stranger Things, as always, moves forward at a clipping pace. And I feel like the pumpkin thing especially has something that has been kind of you know, touched upon for one scene every episode leading up to episode four. Now that Hopper sort of discovered this tunnel that I'm sure we're going to be talking about at the end of this podcast, I wonder if it's going to become a much bigger part instead of just sort of go, you know, doting upon it for one or two scenes. Yeah, agreed. Um, And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how uh, Dr. Sam responds to it, right? Because I think we or I, I know I brought it up last episode, you know, it, can we trust uh, him? Is he is he like just being two faced here? Um, and I think the, the fallout or response from whatever Hopper finds down there, I think might be our answer to that question. He'll, he'll probably say, well, maybe it wasn't contained. Uh, maybe I'll be a thing. <laughs> Number five, Nance wants to take down Hawkins with Jonathan. Um, uh, so Nance, uh, B- Barb's revenge here. Uh, Jack, you critiqued her a lot last uh, season by not really caring about Barb, and uh, she wants vengeance. Well, of course she does now. I mean, she probably... Well, are you saying, a, you're saying a, too little too late, Jack? I'm saying too little too late. I mean, the poor mom and, and parents, we've talked about this before, they still think, Barb, there's a chance. Well, they know there's not a chance. Yeah, I, I thought for a second when Nancy called Barb's mom that it was going to, you know, possibly turn a page on that relationship. But I do feel kind of bad that once again, Nancy was just using this poor mother to exactly. get to the Hawkins lab people the entire time. I mean, yeah, these parents are unfortunately broke. Uh, they're clueless about the fate of their daughter. Maybe one t- day they'll find out about everything that happened. I mean, if this was re- a real life story, we found this out. Would we have any sympathy for Nancy? I think so. Uh, come on. The reason She's Barb doing is the dead. best with what she has. She's the reason Barb what, 16, is dead. 16, 17. The reason Barb is dead is because of her. No, Barb made the choice. She chose to stay. She could have went home. She was okay, just a whatever. fantastic friend. Okay, fantastic that friend. Her, because that was her mistake. Nancy, <laughs> because Nancy isn't a fantastic friend. And <laughs> and, and 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 now she ha- she is letting the parents but believe think, that she's still alive. I think you, in, I, I, if this story was on social media, Nancy would be, she'd have to cancel. She'd have to quit her Facebook account. She'd be getting blasted. All right. Um, let's go to uh, sixth uh, moment here. Eleven goes out on the town uh, and she's not a fan of Sam. I'm jealous. I'm sorry, Max. <laughs> uh, Max. Sam and Max. Fun uh, computer game there. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know guys. I'm, I was off on the Mike and 11 train, I hop back on for that brief stop in the finale. But if this is just going to be a season of like 11, just sort of circling Mike without them actually interacting. And just because she misconstrued this one moment 
where he was helping her up after she fell off her skateboard as some sort of jealousy. I don't know. I don't know. I might have to hop off the train again. Well, g- give it, give her some leeway. She's been through a lot. She's she's also probably going through the hormonal teenager stuff. Um, clearly, you know, and and she's trapped in this log cabin, so she's she's kind of a prisoner again. Um, and she's trying to find out answers about herself. So I would say give her a little bit of leeway, Mike. Don't don't shut it down. What happens all, if, all if right now? What happens if Max and Mike become an item? What what did Dustin? How did Dustin and Lucas react to that? Eh, I it's think, not. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. It's like every Max, Max every girl comes to town. Michael, <laughs> Mike, you take every girl. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I, I think if, if we're full on uh, Order of the Phoenix, Harry Potter here, I think he's just gonna be emo until they get back together. <laughs> and maybe well, he'll still talk- be emo for a little while. Who knows? Well, let's talk about Emo Mike here, because I feel like Emo Mike sort of funnels into Angry Mike, specifically when dealing with Dart, much like he sort of showed some resilience towards, like, we can't lend Max into the group because we already have a mage uh, in the case of Eleven. Here, I think he really has a lot of resilience towards killing Dart because I guess it comes from the upside down, and he holds a lot of resentment to that due to the connections that it shows from both Will's perspective and where he assumes Eleven got banished to by the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, and I I see where he's coming from. I see where he's coming from, and so I don't I, to Jack. I don't think he's now gonna uh, go after Max. I I think he is he is in love, uh, head well, over heels. You, if, if I don't, because I don't trust Max and it's it Billy. Billy, yeah, her non brother. Um, is he right to keep Max at a distance? Is he right to, to keep Max out of the inner circle? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, they, but, there was no, there's but, no outer circle. They never have had the opportunity to have an outter circle. Is it because they, he wants to be the popular kid and finally exclude people after he's been excluded so many times in his life? Well, you you got things that are going on that he that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, but I she's mean, been the, she's, she's, she's been chasing his booger around the school. Like, <laughs> let her in on a couple of secrets, dude. I think she's in on enough secrets myself. I think. <laughs> Mike Mike raised his uh, voice by two pitches there. Yeah, yeah I was going I, 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 a very I, like pre puberty voice. I get that she's helping out with the booger chase. I get that. But I, I still it just I don't trust her and I what's what's going on with her and Billy? I did you know he blames her for something. Yeah. You think you think I think I'm pretty sure you think every new character is a spy at this point. <laughs> uh I do. You're casting I, I think... a Y net to be like, all right, new character, great. They're a spy. You know, mouth-breathing teenager that we saw in the arcade? Probably a spy. In, in, in life, you, you can only have a trust of so many people. Listen, too many Mike, people in. J- Jack has a very small amount of uh, theories or tools. In Lost, it was Rose Bernard work for Dharma. Like, it's just, it's this whole, and, they're, and they're an, it, it's it, an inside it, job. It's a spy, and, whatever. And, as, as it turns out, they did. They just were retired. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's go to the next thing here. Uh, Joyce finds the Thessal Hydra on Bob's camcorder. Um, kind of very, uh, was it? Is it Poltergeist where it's on the TV or whatever? They're here. Um, yeah, I think I think we also like outlined that we talked about this a little bit at the end of the last podcast about I, I think I compared to like Paranormal Activity where like yeah. is it a possibility that the camera saw that's true? Something? Good call. May, maybe it's this idea that like maybe cameras will become a big important thing in this season that you can like you can't see the Thessal Hydra it actually lives here but you can't see it unless you like take a picture of it or something I'm not entirely sure but it is interesting that the camera was able to capture like trace footage of it yeah it, it, it disrupted the smart, magnetic waves smart to get of the, the uh, crayon so and trace paper. what's that Jack I'm sorry Joyce was smart enough to get the trace paper and uh, the uh, crayon yeah the rubbings it. like she was at the uh, war memorial yeah <laughs> um, but yeah, the the VHSC that was a funny moment, yeah. um, and then also uh, Bob's geekery. Um, but uh, if anybody and she, and she, and she, did, and she just things. hangs up on poor Radio Shack Bob. And yeah, well, I, was, I, I wouldn't say geekery. It's kind, it was a little bit of snobbery, you know. When she's like this little this little table, and he's like, "Oh, you can't you can't put a JVC in a VCR." <laughs> Come on now, <laughs> but she's uh, trying to put the little. A little P. It, it, it was it was nice it's JSC, it, like because uh, we I, we have some of those tapes and I have the converter that converts it so it works in that. 
but um, I will say, you know, my frustrations of having to help Jack set stuff up, like, you know, when we try to do this podcast, go back to when we used to have to use uh, coaxial cables uh, and, and things like that hook up to the TV, because I used to be summoned when I was uh, nine or ten to uh, I, I, hook up I VCRs stopped it. I stopped like at that. age 25 and said, I'm not I'm not going with technology anymore. Yeah. So yeah, how'd that work out for you, Jack? I was going to say, it, you it, missed, it, you missed it, that you that giant <laughs> wave just sort of passed you by while you were I, floating I, in the water. I'm saying, Look, it's just going too fast. <laughs> I don't like it. It used to you had a good year, year and a half to figure things out. Now it's like if you don't figure it out in the next three in three weeks, you're left behind. I'm sorry, I'm behind. I don't care. All See, right. you parked your car in the and uh, you didn't go out on the driving range. Technologically speaking, you parked it back in the garage. <laughs> exactly, I did. <laughs> Took your toys and went home. Uh, next up, D'Artagnan escapes. Um, uh, this. Uh, Kind of. I mean, that's like it escapes yeah. to a certain point, and then Will has a little bit of PTSD, and then Dustin takes the opportunity to put it under his hat. So he <laughs> escapes, even so. though he's concealed by one of them. Uh, but because he escaped, Will flashes back, and uh, he takes Bob's advice, uh, which uh, Jack thinks is nefarious, and he kind of stands up to this Thessal Hydra, and uh, he seems to be consumed. Uh, like all his little tendrils go into his eyes and mouth and nose. It's really gross. Um, and Will is consumed by the Thessal Hydra at the end of the episode. Uh, well, Bob was wrong. What are what are your thoughts do we have about this episode, Polywog? Yeah, it's it's interesting, especially the Thessal Hydra, because I mean the Demogorgon as the big bad last season was a literal physical monster. But again, I made the comparison at the very beginning of the episode, but it was like very much when we first saw the smoke monster come about in the in the lost season one finale in yep. Exodus, where you're like, oh, this is like a weird kind of ubiquitous concept. And to have this thing sort of be constructed by this swirling smoke that it can apparently now like infest you and infect you, apparently, is, is still something that I'm trying to wrap my head around. I mean, I'm confident that we'll find out more about what it is and what it does, but it's a. I like how it, it went in a very different direction than the first monster we saw on this show. Yep, agree, Jack. What What are your thoughts here? I, you know, I go back to poor Will. You know, I, I'm saying, you know, the inner circle. I'm gonna defend Mike here a little bit on keeping people out. Well, recently, I think he's key. He, uh, there's secrets because Will is look how he's treated when he walks into school. When when Bob drops him off, everyone's staring at poor Will. He's the zombie boy. I think if they if they knew more about him, it'd be even worse. So they don't. She doesn't trust Max, right? Yeah. You see my point now. I mean, I, <laughs> I think. But, but who does who does who does Will always who does Will always at? Mike Mike when he was when he the the the, the, the on the uh, trick or treat who's who does he call for Mike? Mm-hmm. Mike's his hero. Mike's his, his protector. So uh, Mike's just doing protecting. Okay. Unlike his unlike unlike Nancy. <laughs> All right. Mike, Mike uh, cares about his friends. <laughs> Let's go on to the next episode. Will the Wise. Uh, Will wakes up uh, to the concern of Joyce and his friends. Joyce takes Will home but finds him acting strangely, and he starts drawing scribbles on numerous pages. Joyce calls Hopper for help, and together they discover the scribbles line up, forming a vast network of vines. Hopper recognizes an area and leaves without telling Joyce. Nancy and Jonathan are cut by undercover lab agents when they try to contact Barb's mother. Dr. Owen shows them the portal to the Upside Down and admits Barb died from it, and they went. Uh, they want to prevent other governments from learning of it. When they release, Nancy reveals she recorded Owen's admission. Lucas tries to get closer to Max, but Billy warns Lucas to stay away. Dustin finds that Dart has broken out of his cage and devoured his pet cat and uh, is a baby version of a Demogorgon monster. Eleven, after an argument with Hopper, finds Hopper's research into her biological mother, Terry, eyes and tries to connect with Terry with her powers. Hopper digs in one of the tainted fields and finds a tunnel leading to the Upside Down. So, uh, let's start with the first thing here. The party finds Will. He is frozen, being violated by the Thessal Hydra. He awakes. Um, Thoughts here with Will and just what happened? Like, what's the fallout here? From the the Thessal Hydra being able to, I guess, is it a possession like or or uh, it's something uh, that that happened uh, starting at the end of the last episode? Yeah, it's it, it feel I don't know if it's necessarily possession. I mean, 
we get this analogy of vines, right, as well as drawing mm-hmm. them out. And we talk a lot about the pumpkin patches and how there's a lot of growing and roots underground there. Maybe what the Demogorgon was trying to do to Will, uh, you know, in the end of the first season, which was which was to sort of, I think, you know, lay little Demogorgons within him. Maybe the Thessal Hydra is trying to do that as well to sort of plant its own seed within Will that's eventually going to fester and grow. And maybe the Thessal Hydra doesn't need to come into the real world. Maybe it is now going to come through Will into the real world, which is scary. And I also do want to point out here, uh, I mean, the actor who played Will, his breakdown uh, throughout the course of this episode was so, so good to watch. I know I, I mentioned before about the fact that like hangover syndrome, was he going to be like sort of the odd man out yeah. and he might not, you know, match up acting wise with all these other fantastic kid actors, but he really showed he has chops with yeah. just showing how emotionally struck he was and having a, a huge breakdown as he's saying his lines, which is extremely hard to do. So I give this actor all the credit in the world for playing probably the hardest character in the show at this point. Well, and it's just, like, it's very interesting because, like, he says, and this is kind of the next moment here that I had down, it got Will, he felt it everywhere, and he still feels it. Um, and there's definitely kind of moments throughout where um, he's he's communicating with it, and, and not to uh, harp too much on the E.T. references, but that's kind of what happened between E.T. and Elliot, where there was just this kind of, like, um, uh, connection between the two of them, this, this mental connection um, so it, maybe it's not a possession, but there's definitely something happening there between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I think that, uh, you know, they bring up the true sight in the last episode as well, which yeah. is a and d skill that allows you to see into the astral plane. I mean, you talked about before, but Will talking to Hopper and Joyce and saying how he feels like a bunch of memories at once that he has now memories. I, I don't know if we want to necessarily make him omniscient, I feel like it's always tough in a piece of pop culture when you make a character all seeing and all knowing. I think we saw it this season on Game of Thrones with Bran, how it's you write that character into a corner. So I hope that we're not going in that direction just because I'm not sure how they can really get their way out of it. But the, the, the idea of him having a bunch of memories within himself now is, is so interesting. Well, because it, it's maybe not necessarily these, these uh, uh, omniscient. It may be more, since now he has his connection with the Thessal Hydra, he might just be seeing what that being is seeing or what that the memories that that creature has. Um, and that might be the limitation, is that, that that's that's the connection. He doesn't have anything really beyond that. Maybe. Well, is it, a, is it a flaw that he can see the tunnel, that he knows there's tunnels, and he's, he's letting the, the rest of the world know there's tunnels? When he was doing the crans and Joyce and mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I, I, or 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 is that the plan for the Thessal? Is the Thessal Hydra like Nancy and Jonathan thinking, you know, three steps ahead, playing 3D chess and saying it, yeah. it wants to expose the world to the tunnels so that maybe they accidentally like I don't know, open up the tunnels wider and that oh. allows the upside down to permeate. We talked about oh, so how we feel like there's a is what you're saying, like I perhaps that really could be the case that the Thessal Hydra is now sort of using will as a weapon another spy if you will jack uh accidentally <laughs> so well, i th- i think that i think that it goes to theory with bob i think bob might be the so what does it go to the theory with bob <laughs> <laughs> i think bob has been possessed by the uh there's no grounds for that uh, well, when it, when it happened, you'll go, okay, I'm sorry that you thought three steps ahead. One, one thing we yes. learned about Mike is you don't mess with Sean Astin or any of his characters. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Nobody puts Rudy in the corner. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that's a fair call out. I mean, if, if it'd be interesting if it, if it was a trap. Um, because uh, there has to be a reason why if it was trying to work through... if that's the case, then Hopper's in trouble. <laughs> well, but, yeah, if, it was, if it's trying to work through Will... Then it would have some have some. I would think would have control over not to release information it didn't want out there. So, or well, it, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, but Will got a bunch of information now, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's right, see. We'll see. Next year, Hopper and Eleven have a fight. A pretty intense uh, fight at that. Uh. Um, kind of the fallout of her leaving. Uh, Played this mess up. He was, uh, I think he's right, though. Yes, but it's clear that maybe the um, totalitarian 
uh, approach of parenting uh, might not be working in this situation. I don't know. Well, also, she you me. said she might her hormones and everything like that. You really can't control a a child. A, a it's interesting though. Because, I mean, this is essentially sort of like a way to start over for Hopper. We talked about this in the last podcast about how he was sort of deprived of the opportunity to raise a teenage daughter. And now he's sort of been granted this second chance. But it shows that he's not exactly a perfect parent. Because I, I do think he's taking extra precautions for good reason, considering that he's now even more onto the Hawkins Lab people. That, you know, it, the trouble did not leave with Dr. Brenner. That there's still sort of a lot of danger there. Uh, I mean, he broke, I guess, one of her uh, don't be dumb rules in that he lied. And as she says, friends don't lie. And so he really, uh, even though it's tough to compare, like, lying about being home at a certain time to breaking out of the cabin and introducing yourself to a mother and daughter and possibly endangering yourself and getting caught. Uh, I feel like they both have reason to go after each other here. Yeah. Well, I, th- I, th- I think we talked about before is Hopper lost his daughter. He couldn't protect her. And he's doing everything in his power to protect Eleven. But again, I don't think, she, you know, to be fair to her, she's cooped up in this little cabin. Yeah. Well, he, he I, broke uh, rule number one in parenting is uh, don't lose your cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you have to be the calm uh, and actually understanding well, one. Don't lose uh, your cool to someone who has powers like Eleven. Yeah, don't lose your cool to someone that could. Yeah. I, I think that's more important. <laughs> You're not winning that, that one, Hopper. <laughs> uh, uh, but anywho, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't want to judge anybody's parenting, but I feel like Hopper uh, needed to take a chill pill, maybe walk away, uh, step up, take a step back and count to five. I, I get it, but it's such – like Mike said, he knows what's going on with yeah. the people that want 11. He he knows. I mean, but he, 11 doesn't it, know that. You got, you also gotta th- he I, has to I think know, about what 11's going through. I get it, but he, he's the he's, adult. I get it, but she's in danger, and, and – and I did. I just. I can see. Yeah, again, I see both sides, but on many sides, they're wrong. It's, on many I, sides. I feel, it's interesting because I actually feel like Hopper is surprisingly at the hub of a lot of information that he's not telling anyone. He's not telling anyone about Eleven. He's not telling Eleven about what's going on at Hawkins Lab. You mentioned before in your recap, Jay. Once he finds all the drawings and realizes there are vines, he doesn't even tell Joyce about what's happening. He just takes off and leaves. I I wonder if this is going to come back on him at some point, that had he told somebody something that he was doing, he could have helped someone, prevented something, quite possibly saved his life in the future. Who knows? Well, I think he's trying to protect everybody by kind of keeping everybody out of it. Um, but but who's he going to tell? Why is he going to tell Joyce? I mean, uh, him and Joyce are pretty close confidants during all the weird stuff that was happening that they were forced to sort of keep under their hats. It seems like, you know, he's taking Will to go see Dr. Owens. I don't think they necessarily just said K okay, bye and left each other. But I mean, you do bring up a good point. Hopper even tells Eleven at the beginning of this episode where Eleven says like, oh, you lied. And Hopper says, I don't lie. I protect and I feed and I teach. And I wonder if he's sort of taking this protect and serve motto to extenuate his entire life. And he's not necessarily lying as much as he's withholding information. And it's always a fine line as to whether or not that's actually lying. But I, I do think he's withholding information. I think he is, but I think it's also, like you said, it's it's a form of protecting, too. Yeah. I, I, I see, like I said, I see both sides, but I, I think uh, I'm a side on Hopper. <laughs> As as the uh-huh. father of teenage uh, girls, did you have you lost your cool more than once, Jack? Oh, more than once, at least, yes. <laughs> um, all right, uh, number four, Nance and Jonathan uh, set their trap. Uh, they get Paul, Doctor Paul Reiser, uh, Sam, uh, to uh, admit to Barb's death on a nice little uh, recorder. Is this? Are they? Are they going out of their league a little bit here? Like this? This can't end well right i'm kind of surprised it worked but you also then have to wonder much like we were questioning with the thessal hydra did dr did owens want, want it to work <laughs> yeah it I, was a I, double it was a triple double cross nobody checks their purse <laughs> or backpack whatever she had no much i mean they, they arrest them but don't check they don't they can i i i, I think it's a i think it's like uh mike just said it's a setup but I, but I do like the way this story progressed because, I mean, I was totally 
suckered in. You know, when we hear Owen's guys over the headsets listening into the conversation we hear in the last episode, I'm like, oh, they're going to get caught. And then they're, you know, uh, they're encompassed by all these people in the park. Though they, these people were not like manhandling them. They were saying, do you need a ride? You could just say, no, we're going to wait in the car. And I don't know exactly what they could do there without causing a scene. Uh, But then once they get interrogated and they get shown everything, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. And then we have the tape recorder get pulled out. I was like, oh, wow, they're much more adept than I thought they would be. Forgetting, of course, that they, you know, sprung that whole Home Alone trap to take down the Demogorgon at the end of last season. These are no these are no ordinary teenagers. Well, the kids on the show, we said, uh, you know, during the recap of season one, they're smarter than the adults. For the most part. That's yeah. true. Did we have a? Did, did we see Mr. Wheeler this episode? Did we see Mike Mike and Nancy's dad at all for his uh, dad moment of the week? Uh, we yeah, Nancy, or we saw Nancy's mom. Yeah, I don't know. Right when uh, uh, Jonathan and I think it was that was last episode maybe. We, oh we no not... no no it was it was this episode yeah. when uh, oh no it was it might have been last episode when they yeah, when when she saw that Jonathan was coming over. I think it, it's very surreptitious, but I feel like in the Steve versus Jonathan battle. I feel like Mrs. Wheeler favors Jonathan over Steve. That's just my yeah, two cents on it. I seemed that. She was, she, was, she was fine with him being there. Yeah. But uh, anywho, uh, Will seems to have a reverse fever, uh, and he says he likes it cold. So going back to what's the connection here between Will and the Thessal Hydra, um, they're, they're, it, it's some type of... They're pretty bonded if... He likes it cold, and Will can't uh, or doesn't want to be in the the hot water. Right. I I would say that maybe he is possessed. All right. But yeah, maybe possession is too much. Right, because it, it there it seems like there's moments where it's still Will, or or yeah. is it a, a Will being controlled by something else? I, yeah. That well, that's where I go back to like my analogy of a seed growing. Where like I don't think he's going to turn into a Thessal Hydra by the end of this season, but I feel like there might be uh, certain like features that are starting to permeate Will. It could also connect back to like him being in the Upside Down, which seemed like it was a very cold, unforgiving place, and maybe he just became so connected with there, especially in his last time out when he really bonded with that Thessal Hydra. That he's like, no, I you know really like it. It's like. Uh, not to deviate into Survivor so much, but I know a lot of Survivor contestants say that when they end up getting voted out of the game, if they're in it for a while, they can't sleep on a bed for the first few nights. They can only like sleep on the floor or sleep on a, on a mat just because if you're used to sleeping in a certain way for a number of days, your body gets used to that. Maybe it's because Will spends so much time in the Upside Down. Even a year later, his body, especially when he visits it so frequently, just might not become adjusted uh, to the other to the actual environment of the real world. That's All a good right. call. Um, we go back. Uh, we go to Steve bonding with Billy. Uh, I say that ironically. Um, so Billy's kind of uh, the shower seems a little interesting. He seemed kind of very interested in in Steve. Like it wasn't so much bullying him, but the, it it was. I don't know. I, I didn't trying was trying to weird. form a trying to form a bond so he can be close to him to figure to keep up with what's going on. <laughs> Oh my god. He's not a not spy. Everybody's a spy. Yeah, he's hiding a wire right under his mullet. Uh so, suddenly yeah. he doesn't so he doesn't like the guy, but suddenly he wants he oh wants to be gosh. Steve's best friend. Come on, wake up, Steve. Hashtag no, lazy I, I, I honestly think it's that Billy just wants to be an alpha dog and he keeps emasculating Steve over these past few episodes that I feel like this is another way for him to do it, to sort of like needle into his head because it, it, he was trying to give advice, but at the same time he was saying like, here's advice. Don't let the creepy kid hook up with your girlfriend. So it was still like a very put down way of giving advice. Yeah. Hmm. All right. But, <laughs> we've okay. jacked his devices. He's a spy. Um, it, it's, he's casting just a wide net. It's just, if any of them turn out to be a spy, he's going to like claim that he's the greatest podcaster in the world. We know that, right? Can we also admit that's what's going <laughs> to happen? Look, I, I can say that without being right <laughs> now I, with billy i do want to take a bit of attention and talk about the general pop culture idea of kids cast for teenagers that look way too old i feel like stranger things does a pretty good job at this but i don't know maybe it's like the mustache or like the abs on billy but he <laughs> seems a little too old to be in this high school from my point of maybe, view uh, maybe if he's maybe he's not the sharpest tool in the show maybe he's held back a few years maybe he's like 19 <laughs> you guys ever seen you ever seen 21 jump street <laughs> oh yeah 
Oh, just, yeah. say, uh, uh, just saying that goes to my theory. Oh there my go. God! So now oh, he's so now, it's now like... wait. So now you think that Billy is an undercover cop brought no. into the high school? Who's is the Thessal Hydra? His boss? Is he the chief of the police station? I didn't say he was a cop. I'm just saying 21 the Thessal Hydra goes, plot was. I've had the mayor up my ass. I need. To... <laughs> <laughs> the Demogorgon has had it up to here with you two. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. And you're on unorthodox you ways. It's Bob and Billy as the two uh, 21 Jump Street cops. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just saying. Oh, God. That's how um, it works. Well, like you just said, they, they all do They do a great job. The, the kids that are in high school look like they're in high school. But Billy doesn't. Uh, let's, let's move on. Unless, uh, unless he's living up to his Billy Madison credo. <laughs> and he just has to. He's trying to speed through high school so he gets that inheritance. <laughs> That would make he does have a nice ride though. He though. does, he does. Um, all right. Uh, Eleven finds files about uh, her mother and finds her using her powers. Uh, the mother calls out to her Jane uh, in the other realm. Um, Eleven has a name. She had a name. It was Jane. Did we find out Jane last season though? I feel. Yeah, um, we did. We did a little bit because uh, I think that's what they were they were talking about, and they didn't make the connection until several episodes yeah. later. But this was interesting. I personally did never. I never thought we'd go back to the Terry Ives yeah. thing. I thought it was just a way to sort of describe her backstory, and that was it. But I feel like it's a logical next step for Eleven, though, right? Because she feels spurned by her friends. She feels spurned by her father figure. So she feels like she needs to turn with to the only person that she might have connected with in her lifetime, which is her mother. So. I'm excited to see where this goes from here. I wonder if Eleven will try to escape again and try to join up with Terry Ives, but I kind of like the direction this is going. As long as she's not, again, observing Mike from the bushes, uh, singing every breath you take, I'm good with it. <laughs> well, they have the money now, so it'll just that'll be played over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the scene. Get that on-the-nose music and book choices. <laughs> Um. Yeah. I. I. It was a moving scene because she. She cries like when uh, they just kind of you know blows the dust blows away in the wind of of her mom. Um. And yeah, I think it, it would if we're talking about kind of expanding her character, um, and her kind of finding out about herself. Um. I. I like it. But again, not to knock Hopper's parenting, but. Uh, do, do you have to have all those files like right underneath the house? She's there all day by herself. Wouldn't you think she might run into that? I and, don't know. And label label the box Hawkins, Hawkins Lab. Lab. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe label don't it something look, else. Don't look in here, Eleven. <laughs> yeah, you should you should have wrote like porn on it to yeah, like try or, to be at least a little shady about it. Or uh, definitely not egos. That helps. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, uh, we then go to Will Colors the Christmas Lights for this season. Uh, he's drawing vines. So uh, I, I think we talked about, you know, what could be, is this that kind of, because it seems to be paint or you know, pasted all through the house. Um, uh, thoughts here on uh, the vines and what they represent. We kind of already touched upon it a little bit. Uh, uh, Will, I'm sorry, Mike, you said that uh, it could be a trap being set by Will here. Mm -hmm. or the and I wonder... Do, I mean, Hopper obviously goes to the farm to look at these vines, but do you think Will was actually drawing what might be underneath the house? Because let's remember, oh. I mean, oh, there yeah. there were like holes in the air around the buyer's household that connected to the upside down. Maybe there's some more substantial foundation there. By the way, I don't know if you guys noticed that the buyer's house underwent a bit of a renovation since last season. They have yeah. a new siding to their house that yep. looks pretty good. It does. Well, they, we saw kind of the, the last episode like, oh, it got done up pretty nice. Well, they I probably guess maybe, got some, maybe Hawkins got, funded that. Yeah, uh, right now. I was going to say they probably got some money from them. Um, you know, a little uh, hush money. Number nine, get a, get a new phone at least. <laughs> yeah. Number nine, uh, Billy's racist, I, I guess, or he just doesn't like any kids being around his not sister. <gasps> oh, I was, I was wondering why you wrote that. I'm like going, Billy's racist. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know, Jay, when we were talking about, like, the previews going to this season, you said that apparently, like, the Billy character was supposed to be written like one of the typical Stephen King bullies who's mean just for the sake of being mean. And I definitely am starting to get, like, a Henry Bowers from It vibe from Billy, who also, the Henry Bowers character was also very racist. So, I mean... I, I don't want the show to go to sort of traipse this topic. I have a feeling it will just because 
it's going to acknowledge the fact that Lucas is the only person of color that really is in this town. Uh, but I just hope that it doesn't turn into anything really that ugly. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 concerning, especially if he is more pure evil. Um, but uh, yeah, I I would agree. It's it's definitely like this. The whole scene is like, ugh, this is this is getting ugly, um, and it, and it could get much worse. He grabs uh, Max's arm. Um, it's just yeah, it's it's uh, no bueno for sure. Uh, number ten here, Dart kills poor Muse, baby Demogorgon. Or is this uh, is this a is this a different type of Demogorgon? Like uh, you know how now, Aliens Three was a, a, a dog. Like maybe is it taking different forms, or is this just a well, baby I, Demogorgon? I have to ask, as a cat owner, how did you feel watching this scene? They, you know, they it's in shows they're always more comfortable killing the cats. Uh, it didn't it didn't bother me personally. I I know I didn't know Muse. I didn't have a connection. You know, they didn't spend a lot of time developing this character, so the death didn't hit me too hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, I that ruined one of my theories. I thought the cat was going to be a spy. <laughs> maybe, so, maybe, maybe the cat was, but she was starting to talk, so they had to get taken care of. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, you had to off it. <laughs> that could have been. That could have been it. One too many meows. <laughs> so. Um. But, uh, yeah, things, uh, to your point, Mike, uh, you, you, last episode you said, is this creature going to be like a porg uh, or like some type of cute Ewok kind of thing this for some merchandising opportunities? Uh, I guess they didn't really take that route uh, with this Get this for now. your cat! Um, well, where does it go from here? I mean, this is clearly a demogorgon of some sorts. So so um, does Dustin wake up? Does Dustin go, okay, it killed my mom's cat, and the my mom loved There's the cat everywhere. And me. Is he going to get pinned for this murder? That's the other thing. <laughs> Dustin, <laughs> you killed Mr. Muse. You were so jealous of him. Uh, I mean, I feel I feel like he has to. Yeah, he'll definitely bury the cat. But like you said, there's a lot of blood all around, and that's going to be really tough. I wonder if Dustin, purely by needing help just to cover things up, is going to tell everyone. Uh, I would say that in another type of show. It would still be a couple of other episodes that Dustin will literally hold this idea under his hat. But again, this show moves so quickly and there's so much going on that I'll make a bold claim here that I assume episode five, one of the first things we see is Dustin telling the rest of the gang what happened and fessing up to his lying. I think Dustin goes to the, the library and gets five more books on how to cover up a murder. <laughs> he's building up such a tab at this point, Jack. Because so I, I think that's what he's going to do. I mean, I, I, he, he can't. T- How does he tell his mom? And it looks he like can't. an indoor he cat. Be able to. It's it's an indoor cat. So what does he say? Uh, I left the door open last well, no, night. Well, it, it seemed to be outside. Crack is he was, it out- was outside in the trash can. Okay, true. You know, we have coyotes in the area, mom. They're in like I uh, uh where are they again? Indiana? I don't Indiana. Indiana. We had a we had a, a bear attack, mom. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, and last, Hopper digs a hole into the upside down vine. And it kind of closes that. It's it's a scene that was in the trailer where it's kind of this weird tunnel, and it, then it goes upside down. Uh, so the upside down on has, that note <laughs> has has expanded, uh, it, or it's seemingly expanded out. And we talked about it during the first season of the show because there, there was these other portals that were showing up. So is this is this the tunnels of like how or, or they're get, or at least the original Demogorgon was getting around maybe. Mm, Cause this be like the Dharma stations for the for the, <laughs> the, the big bads. There you go, the pumpkin. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, or it's just it's just at least that it, it's the upside down has has left Hawkins' lab at least. Yeah, it yeah, seems I, like again going back to this uh, vines idea that it's definitely permeated its initial source and is now really starting to seep into the rest of the environment. So it feels like. While last season there were like random smatterings across town, but the real big gate was at Hawkins' lab. And Owens tries to assert, sure, Jonathan and Nancy, like, no, we've got the gate taken care of. They don't necessarily need to worry about the gate because it seems like there's so many other entrances in other places that they're guarding one door, but there's essentially a, a hole, a big hole in the roof. There's no roof, and anything could get in at this point. Exactly. Yep. Um,. All right. Well, any any final thoughts for these two chapters before we move to listener feedback? 
want to no. take that pause as a no. Let's <laughs> uh, let's jump. I'm in. ready. To, I'm ready to watch the next two. Is what I'm ready. To do. <laughs> well, you can. Did, after did, this. did you did you end up watching episodes three and four right after we recorded, as you said you were going to last week? Yes. <laughs> I was up to like three something in the morning, and I watched. They're, them not, again. they're not long episodes, Jack. But I, we recorded uh, another podcast, and then I once I got I uh, did okay. some other things, and by the time I sat down to watch it. It's like already one o'clock. One. I was gonna say, did you have to call Jay and ask him like to set up the coaxial cables to watch Netflix? <laughs> How to hook up this Netflix VCR to the TV? Actually, it's just easy. I just hit Netflix and it just came on. So. Oh man! All right. As long, uh, as, long as the password's saved, I'm okay. Let's uh, let's go into the feedback here. Uh, titled "Stranger Things," no spoilers. I'm only two episodes in, but based on your comments for two point one Mad Freak. Or, uh, yeah, uh, I'm wondering if maybe Max is the equivalent of Will from somewhere else. We learned at the beginning of Mad Max that uh, 8 was in Pittsburgh. What if maybe 9 or 10 was being studied in Modesto or something? Hey, it was good enough for American Graffiti. And Max got hauled into the Upside Down and made it out, but told uh, she would have to go to Hawkins for observation just like Will. We saw lots of monitors uh, at the bad guy's lair that could be uh, observation rooms. And that would answer the question about why Max's brother was saying it was her fault they had to be there. Uh, It could also answer the question about how Max could have uh, special dig dug powers. Uh, We know that (laughs) Will was affected by his time in the Upside Down. So maybe dig dug powers are a side effect of Max's time in the Upside Down. I know Jack has the corner on crackpot theories, but uh, I could always be corner adjacent. Um, thanks for indulging me. Now I'm going to watch the episode. Uh, Peace, Ed from Sonora. That's a good theory. I thought yeah. that was my. I thought that was my theory. No, you. I think thought I said that's what. I, that's why. She, no, I thought that Ma- in the first two episodes, I thought. Ma- remember, I said maybe that's why Max has some special powers because that's why she's so good at dig dug. No, right, but but, no, but but that's that's more of an eleven type of thing. I think what Ed's saying is that it's more of a will type of thing where um, she. I had her own it. experience, and then she's getting sent to Hawkins for undergoing. Yeah, did you not, uh, did you not listen to the email? He literally said it was more of a will thing than a than an eight or nine or. 10. Yeah, I, I I heard that, but I I think more of my I think I think I'm more correct than Ed. <laughs> now the thing is, since we're now dealing with tunnels, is Max's dig dug powers really going to come into the forefront? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good that's a good point. That's a really good point. <laughs> is that going to be like her? Uh, 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 from, There's no uh, wasted Jurassic scenes Park, at this, at this show. I know this, yes, and it's going to be the, the digging the tunnels. <laughs> I know these tunnels. Get that! <laughs> they match up with Dig Dug perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Coincidence? Um, I think not. All right, Ed, we'll have to have a contest to who's right, but I I think it's At least Ed put I'm more good. thought into it than uh, they're all spies. I didn't say. I, well, I said Max could be. I said she could be have the same powers Eleven has. I don't remember that, Mike. Do you remember I, that? I remember Eleven, but again, this theory is about Will, not about Eleven. Yeah. And I would say yeah, if we're comparing the it, two, I lost interest I've, in Ed's theory. <laughs> All right. Well, now the cards are truly out. I do feel like if we're comparing the two, I think Max is more likely to have something to do to be more in the Will camp than the. I don't think she's a number. At this point, I, I feel has, like have we seen her wrist? Like we haven't seen a, a, a number on her wrist, or so maybe the, she is. She is made. wearing long sleeves the entire time, That's but it also always is the wearing ball. long sleeves. <laughs> All right. Um, what ha- what happens is here's here's what happens is is Mike falls in love with Max, and so there's a duel between Max and Eleven for Mike's love, mm-hmm. with their powers going back and forth. What do you think? What what's their powers going to be? Uh, Mike's going to say hold hold down for a second. And, you know, let's play the original Super Mario Brothers and see who gets the higher score. <laughs> well, uh, it could be. Well, it, it could be Dig Dug because Max is a, is well, a ringer. So. Super Mario Brothers isn't out yet. The first Mario Brothers game was, I think. But yeah, Super that, Mario uh, yeah, that's what I meant. The, 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 like the one where you uh, stu- you like kick off turtles yes. in the stationary level where you can, where you can it wraps around. Yeah. What about Pac-Man? Was Pac-Man out yet? Pac-Man was out, yes. Okay, the, well, it'll be Pac-Man. <laughs> it'll be How about Miss Pac- Pac-Man? I'm more of a Miss Pac-Man guy myself, but you know. I'm more Pac. I had Pac-Man fever, so I just, I, I find uh, Miss Pac-Man, you know, very a well-rounded, attractive female lead. <laughs> She's <character>. literally round. <laughs> She's a circle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't 
It's always yapping though. Pop, 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 pop. Yeah. I mean, just that side art. I, I was just like, ah, she's like, I'm attracted to this Miss Pac-Man. I don't know. I gotta play this game, not this boring yellow Pac-Man game. Um. Anyways, uh, this next uh, email is titled "Mike's Dad's Comment." Hey guys, I'm partway through the season premiere podcast, and I just want to mention something. The lame dad comment about jumping off a bridge was actually jumping off a cliff, cliff, which Mike actually did. I thought that was a neat nod to last season. Enjoying the huh. podcast, thanks. Ooh, wait a minute. What if Mike's dad was there because he's a spy? <laughs> he knew well, about know, everything. But to be to be fair, if you're going to play a spy, you want to be as low-key as possible, right? <laughs> You don't want to stand out. The dad would make a perfect spy. Well, how long has he been undercover for? Like, since this kid's birth? Has this been an, <laughs> well, an 11 year operation? I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of love between the mom and the dad. It looks like he's just, he's just in it for the money or something like that. I don't know. Oh my God. All right. Uh, P.S. I listened <laughs> to you guys all through Lost. After my first episode of Stranger Things, I looked you up again. Happy to still uh, see you're still doing your thing, Mindy. Thanks, Mindy. Glad to have you listening. Great email, Mindy. Uh, next, Good job, Mindy. <laughs> next email here is from Carol uh, about episode three. Loving this show. Season two does not disappoint. My favorite scene so far is Joyce trying to figure out the VHS tape, especially the camera shot through the VCR. I love the bits of humor thrown in with the horror. I feel sorry for Elle. No wonder she's escaping. It's a pretty depressing cabin. I think Hopper needs to go on an out-of-town shopping spree for her. In all seriousness... Hopper needs to start sharing more information with Elle and Joyce. He expects them to share, but doesn't mm-hmm. in return. So they go off and do stuff on their own. Um, is the lab trying to contain the Upside Down or just making it worse on purpose? Oh. 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 That's interesting. Uh, I'm enjoying the podcast, but can't wait. Uh, but I can't wait. I've got to binge the rest. Thanks for all your hard work, Carol. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with Carol. I don't know if I'm necessarily like team anti hopper but i'm definitely agree with her that i think he if he was sharing more information i think he'd make both his home and work life better yeah but it'd make, it'd make for a boring show if he if he shared yeah i mean that's that's true as well i, I guess i'm making the same argument as to like yeah. oh if this person had a cell phone it'd make the, everything <laughs> so much easier i understand well, it's, for it's, like plot contrivances like, but it's like loss when they found the the medical hatch and nobody told jack yeah the doctor but in fairness, Jack never told anybody else. So I mean, not not to. Well, that's that's the why they held. That's why they held the information on him. But still, who who should know on that? I learned it from you, hats? Jack. I learned it from you. Maybe the doctor. Um, well, speaking of doctor, let let's talk about this theory that Carol brought up. That you know, Owens claims to the teenagers, "Hey, we're tr- we're containing it. We got everything under control." But what if they're actually purposely exacerbating the problem? Yeah, I mean, that will kind of tie into the. Uh, Paul Reiser's character from Alien, where you know, acting like they're trying to you know, make sure to get out of there alive, but really he wanted to bring back a, 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 a an implanted so you're person. Sa- so you're saying Riser has no range of acting, is what you're saying? Well, no, just he, he, can only, that... he, he can only play one character. No, they no, because Riser's playing. Multiple He's playing two but... characters: guy who has nefarious intentions and guy who's married to Helen Hunt. Those are all <laughs> the only two characters he can play. <laughs> <laughs> but they said they're uh, inspired for this character by his performance in that movie, and they happened to just they hired him for that character because um, I guess his uh, Paul Reiser's kids were fans of uh, Stranger Things and told him he had to do it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's a good call out, though. It's a real good call out. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of it. That I don't way. know. I kind of still like this idea because I think Hawkins lab was still kind of in the we have no idea what we're doing camp. You know, when you have Brenner saying, oh, look at this new little hole that we found in the basement. Let's go explore it. I kind of hope that Hawkins still kind of takes that mentality. But it would be interesting if somehow in this year since they decide under new management to sort of try to harness its power and try to really build it to a fever pitch so they can find out exactly what it is. Or they're trying to build build some kind of weapon, you know, to you know, still the Cold War. Keep That's the... true. They, I feel like there there was some Soviet talk this episode. Yeah, they, wasn't they, there? I, thought, I, I thought they, I thought they said we don't want the Russians. Something about we don't want the Russians to know, or something like that. Yeah. So maybe they're trying to, like you said, harness this weapon to get this ultimate weapon to, you know, get one up on the Russians. You know. All right. Jack's going to like this next email from Laura. Hi, Jay, Jack, and Mike. Great first episode uh, for season two. I can't wait to hear uh, what scared Mike this week. 
Uh, Mike, what this uh, we didn't. Uh, I don't remember any jump scares really from these couple of maybe some of the dart stuff, but what, yeah, the dart you? stuff was a little was a little bit of a jump scare. I mean, I was I was mortified by the eating of the cat, but that was less of a jump scare and more of just like being horrified at the idea of this live animal getting eaten. So different type of scare. <laughs> um. Uh, here are my random thoughts for questions for episodes three and four. Dustin broke the golden rule. Friends don't lie. Uh, Bob is adorable, but is he for real? I know he mentioned uh, knowing Joyce in high school, but he also talked about Maine. Part of me thinks he's a plant from Hawkins Lab to keep his eye no! on Joyce and Will. <laughs> my son mentioned Bob's story uh, about being scared by the clown and how it sounds similar to Pennywise from It. Nice 80s reference there. Uh, does anyone be- feel bad for Steve? I do. I think he redeemed himself last season. And I hope his story arc gets better. Are Nancy and Jonathan smart or stupid? I haven't been uh, on Facebook too much, so I don't get spoiled. And I apologize if it's already mentioned. Uh, have you guys checked out this Twitter account, uh, Hopper Dancing 2? Uh, there's some great song picks in there, including Jay's favorite journey. I mean, Ghostbusters. I heard that David Harbour personally selected the song used in this episode, Jim Croce's You Don't Mess Around With Jim. Uh, that's all I've got this time. Looking forward to your next episode. Uh, so, Jack, you got a supporter here on Bob's I got, Spy. I, I, I got to say, I'm being I, I'm being completely non-biased here, but that's the best email we've ever got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I I like the uh, well, I don't like the Bob is a is a spy or working for Hawkins Lab theory, but I, I do like the Pennywise connection as well. With you know, he was haunted by this clown in his dreams, and the only way to stand up to it uh, was to literally stand up to it. Which spoiler alert for it. That's kind of what they have to do. It feeds, literally feeds on kids' fears. And once the kids actually stand up to it and defeat their fears, that's when it gets weakened. Do the kids say easy peasy? <laughs> like Bob? Oh, my God. Anyways, I like uh, it. Steve, uh, do we feel bad for Steve here? I don't feel bad. Like, I don't, I don't think... I, I admittedly felt bad when I, I know Nancy said like, oh, I was drunk. I didn't know what I was saying. But isn't the phrase like drunk minds, sober hearts that like she wouldn't have been lying even if she was under the influence of alcohol? And the fact that she couldn't say it there, I, I do feel for Steve. I think we've all been in that position where you're in a relationship where you feel like you're investing much more than the other person. So even though Steve has an interesting way of expressing his feelings and expressing that sort of fury, I do feel for where he's coming from. I do like that they did clear up. I mean, at least uh, Jonathan said that Steve told him to take uh, Nancy home. We don't see it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't was Jonathan. I know you were ticked off uh, last last well, week. Well, yeah. As, last as, episode, as a as yeah. a you know as a parent, you want you know you're, if you take my daughter somewhere, you better bring her back sober. Number one. Number two, you bring her back. You know, if you took her, you bring her back. And you know, there's so much that could have happened to her there. But did do we think Jonathan was telling the truth, or was he trying to be uh, the nice guy for Steve, even though they don't have a, it? Just seemed odd that he would he would stick up for Steve if he didn't have to. I'm still confused about the Jonathan Steve relationship. Are they just like not really acknowledging each other at this point? Which again is a, is an improvement from Steve bullying him last season. But I feel like we always see them hang out with Nancy and never actually talk with each other. Uh, so who knows? This could have been another like passing thing of Jonathan being like, oh, or Steve telling Jonathan, like, by the way, Nancy's wasted. Take her home. Uh, but yeah, I, I still feel like we don't we haven't seen. Uh, it's a weird like Bechtel rule. We've never seen Steve and Jonathan in the same room talking about anything but Nancy. So I feel like that's yet to be seen on this show. All right. And I, I, I kind of feel bad for Steve. <laughs> I mean, he does. He, I mean, thought out said, say you love me. I mean, just do you love me? And he got nothing. Yep. Then, he, then he had to go get his butt kicked in basketball again <laughs> right after. So it's like, come on, Steve. We need you in here. This guy's killing us. Um, and I, I will have to, have to check out the Twitter account Hopper Dancing to. Uh, that sounds yeah. like fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, that is it for listener feedback. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Stranger Things with Jay, Jack, and Mike. Give us a call at 385-309-0311. Call anytime. Once again, that's 385-309-0311. Call anytime with questions, comments, and or theories. And or theories. Send an email to strangerthingsjjm at gmail.com. Once again, that's strangerthingsjjm at gmail.com. Uh, remember, whatever you post, even if you're ahead, as long as you put it in the title, what episodes this talks about, 
that's fine. Because for some of you that want to go ahead, that's fine. But if you have thoughts like while you're watching the episodes, feel free to put in those emails and we'll talk about them when we're podcasting about those episodes. Just as long as you be, put in the be, title, we're fine. Be careful. Like eight or nine, you're on eight or nine. You find out that I was right. You don't put Jack is right. <laughs> I'm it's not, just assumed I'm not in every episode title. I'm not concerned. Uh. <laughs> and um, and just and just so you guys, because I know we were sort of like mulling over on air uh, the way we're going to be broadcasting these things. I think the way we sort of decided through hearing about stuff on the Facebook group is we'll do five and six next time, seven and eight the time after that. And I think we're going to do since apparently after episode nine, there's a bunch of like after show stuff that they do a lot of. I don't know. I guess like. In the, in the realm of Talking Dead, like a lot of interviews with yep. the cast and crew. I feel like it's worth it to not only just talk about the finale on its own, but also like unpack the season overall and talk about all the post-show material. So we'll probably do nine and that material on its own standalone podcast the Monday after Thanksgiving. Yes, uh, and it, it's a, it's a, sh- sh- a, separate, a separate show <laughs> on Netflix because it's like it pops up when I open up the Netflix app, but I think, I think it is after stranger things or whatever it is. Um, but it looks like Jim rash, uh, hosts it of community, um, Dean fame. Yeah. Dean. I hope he, I hope he dressed up as the, uh, Dina Gorgon. <laughs> <laughs> you knew if community was on like season 10 at this point, they would make a joke like that. Oh, they'd have oh, to, they, they, they no, would. he would definitely come in as 11. Like that would happen. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Totally. would. <laughs> And, and what's his name would come as dressed as uh, Mike. Who? Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, Donald Glover. I mean, I guess he'd come back to the show. Uh, Donald some Glover. Point. That would be. Uh, who was the Are guy like that Keith, he was? Keith, Keith David when he was in the last season? No, the guy that was always uh, Joel McCray. Oh, I, thought, I was oh. confusing him for Lucas. Uh, he, he always flirted with Joel McCray's character. No, uh, uh, Joel McHale. Joel McHale. Nice. Joe, Joe McCray. <laughs> yeah, whatever his name is. <laughs> He's a spy, I'm telling you. Well, I can't oh, the, Joe McRae! I can't remember the, his character's name. Are we talking about Abed? No. No, no. Never mind. No, let's just move, move on. on. Um, we're, 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 we've guessed every character. There's only two more left. <laughs> Radio Shack might be going out of business, but there's plenty of places to get your electronics when you need them. On janejack.com slash Amazon, uh, are you in need of those uh, coaxial cables um, or just, in and outs? Just, just ask for Bob. <laughs> Go to janejack.com slash Amazon. It'll look like the normal Amazon that you're used to, uh, but uh, instead, uh, a small percentage of all those sales goes to the Jane Jack production fold. I want to thank Tack from Tokyo, Eckhart Richter, Molly the Millennial, and Ed the Letter Carrier for your support of us through our Patreon page. And thank you to all of our patrons. If you'd like to become a patron today, whether you give $1 all the way on up a, a month, it helps make these shows possible. Um Find out more by going to jjack.com and click on the Become a Patron link today. Uh, what also really helps is writing reviews. We've gotten a lot of reviews uh, kind of leading up here to Season 2 and going into Season 2. Thank you for everybody that has written a five-star review. If you love what Jay, Jack, and Mike do, give us a review. Uh, go to jjack.com slash iTunes to find all of the Jane Jack podcasts and uh, and give us a review. It helps. It goes a long way. Um I thought it was, actually, I thought it was kind of cool when I searched Stranger Things in the podcast app on my phone. Uh, as, I, I, as I got to like the Stranger, then like TH, the second thing that popped up was Stranger Things with Jay, Jack, or Mike. So obviously mm. we're hot right now in the search engine. What, what was the first thing? Uh, I think it just said Stranger Things podcast. Huh. But hmm. running, yeah, running very hot before, like Will's bath, would become very, very cold at some point. <laughs> <laughs> But anyways, thank you for all of your support. We could not do it without our listeners. Uh, check out all of our other shows. Uh, Mike, it is Survivor season, so you're a busy man. Where can people find some of your other stuff? Uh, you can follow everything I'm doing usually at a Mike Bloom type. Every Thursday, I come out with exit interviews for the most recently voted off Castaway for Parade. Had a really fun discussion the past couple of weeks with the most recent boots in particular. I also do a weekly Survivor fun and games podcast called the RHAP B&B for Rob has a podcast. I just covered the uh, Larry David hosted episode of SNL on post show recap. So a lot of stuff going on, but I'm, I, I can't believe we're almost already halfway through the stranger things season. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this season so far. And I, I just can't wait to see, especially with that discovery in the latter half of the episode, I'm so excited to see where this all goes and what exactly the vines do mean from both a literal and a metaphoric perspective uh, in the case of will. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 
Exactly. And Jack, uh, where can people find you? Uh, nobody cares. All right. Um, in hell. <laughs> in hell. Let me out. <laughs> All right, that'll do it Get for this week's show. Lawn. We'll see you guys next time. Hasta luego and goodbye. Bye. Bye.